Hi, this is Ivan Alon, the Founder and Chief Investment Officer at Align Wealth Advisors Investment Management, also known as Awain. So, uh, first of all, happy holidays. Happy Hanukkah. Hope you had a very good Hanukkah. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And wishing only the best for you and your family in the new year. Uh, I would like to uh, turn our attention to the most recent research highlight that was published on December 6th. Uh, it is on our website and you can see um, the highlight uh, behind me. Uh, if you go to our website and under four advisors drop down to research highlights, you'll see um, the full text that um, I'll reference uh, some of the data points that we share in this recent, recent highlight, uh, research highlight. And, um, and it's kind of a big question. The question that is posed is, what does the relationship between the Fed funds rate, the U.S. Treasury, the 10-year U.S. Treasury, and the S&P 500, what kind of correlations can we deduce looking back at three decades in the past? Uh, the most recent one post-pandemic, obviously the start of a new decade, uh, going all the way back to 1999, looking at the lost decade, and then also looking at the raging bull market between 2009 and 2019. So, so th these are very interesting times because the relationship between the 10-year U.S. Treasury and the Fed funds rate is not as correlated as you might think. Uh, as a matter of fact, during the lost decade between 1999 and 20, uh, 2009, the 10-year uh, the U.S. Treasury basically steadily declined from around 6.25% to 3.85%. And, and that was a pretty, uh, more or less, steady decline. However, the Fed funds rate during that exact same period of time oscillated from over 6% all the way down to 1%, back up to 5%, all the way down to 0.05%. So a tremendous amount of volatility and oscillation within the Fed funds rate, which of course is the right for the Fed fund, uh, Federal Reserve Board and the Fed Chair uh, you know, to manage that Fed funds rate. But right off the bat, you can recognize, and of course this decade resulted in a cumulative loss for the S&P 500 of minus 9.1% over that entire period of time, an annualized loss of 0.95%. This is 1231-1999 to 1231-2009. So for a whole 10 years, there was no money to be made in the, in the S&P 500. Uh, as a matter of fact, you lost money uh, in the S&P 500 during that period of time. And the Treasury was making a steadily steady decline, and the federal funds rate was oscillating wildly during that period of time. And again, we're not looking at, the, at any other conditions during this particular period of time. We're just looking at these three variables. Because there's, there's an, an inordinate amount of focus and interest in the Fed funds rate today. People are overly obsessed with it thinking that it um, essentially, what the, whatever the Fed board does next with the Fed funds rate and all of these predictions and all of these forecasts, um, you know, it's kind of uh, incredible. I mean, it, it, it's essentially that people are banking on uh, certain amounts of rate cuts to occur next year. Meanwhile, from our perspective, the Fed funds has just been very clear. The Fed funds, uh, the, sorry, the, the Federal Reserve Board has basically said, hey, we're, we're ready to do something if need be. We're ready to uh, cut if we have to cut. We're ready to raise if we're going to if we if we're seeing that inflation is still uh, rearing its ugly head. And and I think that's something that market participants, investors, financial advisors, folks should be keeping that in mind. That uh, the the Fed uh, the the job of the Fed is certainly not done, and we may very well just be. Um, uh, off and running to see when exactly uh, inflation and, and a victory for inflation can be declared. 
and it certainly seems a little bit too um, early to declare that victory completely. And, uh, and we certainly have not seen a, uh, the, the full impact of all of these r really significant, rapid uh, increases in the Fed funds rate since March of 2022. And please keep in mind that it is long and variable lags before you see the impact from these increases in market rates and interest rates. And so it's, you know, it's been, uh, with a little come up on two years in March. So it's been a year and three quarters. And, uh, and around two years is when you really start to see the impact and CFOs or corporations are really more or less scrambling to try and manage around their, their interest payments and, and what, what is the debt and principal that is coming due and what are the refi options that are available. Those refi options are not looking particularly great. And so companies are looking at their cash reserves in order to pay down debt which is a sensible thing to do. But there are many other areas in their line item of expenses that they can go to in order to meet that increased interest payment demand. And so uh, it is uh, entirely likely that a CFO at a company would pivot to payrolls and recommend to their, you know, their C-suite colleagues that it's time to reduce payrolls because that is an effective way to maintain their credit rating of a company, which is, of course, an incredibly important thing because it will impact all future uh, cost of taking on new debt. So, so uh, this is certainly in the forecast of the Fed. This is absolutely in what they've included in their um, bulletins and in their summaries. Um, they are expecting an increase in uh, the unemployment rate and they do expect that there will be layoffs. How significant those layoffs really depends on consumption and demand. And demand uh, has shown maybe um, little to no signs of weakness. And certainly at an aggr aggregate level, it's looking quite robust. Even removing the impact of inflation, uh, consumption has remained very robust in the United States. And so this is, uh, this is difficult because it's certainly an inflationary driver. So, so, so this is, uh, uh, I think, one of the most interesting things to look at. And certainly here in the Investment Committee at Awain, we're, we're um, a little maybe overly obsessed about uh, looking at the, at the past and economic conditions uh, within various periods of time. To, to really glean what happens next. So as we think about the, the next six years, starting in 2024, right around the corner, and looking at the next six years of this decade, is this going to be another lost decade? And if you look at recent market performance since the Fed funds rates began being um, raised, in March of 2022, the S&P 500 has basically been in a narrow trading band and it really hasn't gone much of anywhere, although in particular in 2023, it's been a phenomenal year, but that phenomenal year has been driven by seven stocks. The vast majority, over 80%, I mean, I've heard statistics as much as 90% of the return of the S&P 500 in 2023 has been due to seven companies. Meanwhile, there's 500 companies in the S&P 500. Um, this is one of the reasons why in our client portfolios, and for clients that are watching this, uh, you do not have exposure to the S&P 500 as a market-weighted index. We have exposure in the portfolios uh, in an equal weight um, exposure because we're very concerned about these incredible uh, price movements to the upside for these very few companies. And, and recently, the good news is we're beginning to see more market breadth, small and mid cap companies in the US beginning to show um, you know, some very nice returns. And our portfolios have benefited very well from that because we have an overweight uh, in those areas. Um, and that is because we're more defensive and concerned about what those valuations are for those very few companies that, by the way, 
are at those lofty levels of prices because of the artificial intelligence uh, mania that's captured so many market participants. However, the, the real impact of AI will really be seen uh, in, uh, in years to come across multiple industries and certainly won't be uh, only benefiting those few seven companies. Um, and certainly their EPS growth, the earning per share growth of those seven companies has not been particularly great, which is one of the reasons why we termed it the mediocre seven, not the magnificent seven. Um, we've termed it as the mediocre seven earlier this year, as we do think they're kind of mediocre in terms of their fundamentals, uh, their fundamental financial data and how they've been performing fundamentally. So these are some thoughts to keep in mind as we move into 2024 and what lies ahead, not only in 2024, but beyond. And so we continue to maintain a, a more cautiously optimistic posture and the portfolios are positioned accordingly. Um, but uh, we, we are certainly concerned uh, that there may be some kind of credit event uh, that uh, really brings to the forefront the true risk that is within our uh, corporate environment and our U.S. economic environment due to these prolonged higher interest rate levels. And looking at history, we can see that there are periods of time when the Fed funds rate may be cut quite a bit, but market rates can still remain at elevated levels. And this is the key takeaway that I wanted to make sure that uh, our viewers today uh, understood is that there are periods of time when you can truly see a dislocation between what's happening in the Fed funds rate and the decisions the Federal Reserve Board may be making relative to what is actually taking place in market interest rates. And that's what matters. That's what matters for bond pricing. That's what matters for debt financing. That's what matters for refinancing um, is the supply and demand around those types of debt instruments and debt markets. As always, please feel free to reach out to us. Give us a call here at 310-795-0622 or email us at info at alignwealthllc.com. That's info at A-L-I-G-N-E wealthllc.com. And we'd be very happy to continue the conversation. And again, very happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Hope you had a happy Hanukkah and happy, very healthy, happy and prosperous New Year.